Okay, uh, welcome to lecture two, uh, week one. I'm gonna spend a little more time, like I said, in neuroanatomy of the brain. I wanted to shorten these slides so there's not too much and you don't get too lost with everything. There's a lot to cover. So brain tissue is categorized as either white matter or gray matter. So the brain is composed of either white matter or gray matter. White matter is the myelinated axons of neurons, and the gray matter is composed of nerve cell bodies and dendrites. It's the working area of the brain and contains the synapses and the area of neuronal connections. The outermost surface of the brain is structured to contain grooves and dips, uh, which allows for more surface area and connections and functions and communications within the brain. The grooves in the brain are um, called sulci, as you can see here, and the deeper grooves are fissures. And then the gyri or gyrus are the raised areas. And there are distinct anatomical areas of the brain, and the brain is subdivided into the cerebrum, which we see here, and the brain stem, which you can see in, down in here. And then there's the cerebellum, which we'll talk about that in length a little bit as we go along. Now, the cerebrum is the largest part of the brain, and it's divided into two halves, the right and left cerebral hemispheres. The left hemisphere is dominant in most people, and it controls right-sided body functions. And the right hemisphere controls most left-sided body functions. And normal functioning requires effective coordination between both hemispheres. And then these hemispheres are connected by a large bundle of white matter called the corpus callosum. And it's an area of sensorimotor information exchange between the two hemispheres. Now, each hemisphere is divided into four major lobes which work in an interactive and integrated manner, and each with a distinct function. So first, we have the frontal lobe. It's the largest and most developed area, and it functions in motor function. It's responsible for controlling voluntary motor activity, um, coordinates movement of multiple muscles, um, and it's the seat of executive functioning, working memory, reasoning, planning, prioritizing, it's also got the language area, Brockett's area, which is back here, expressive speech, and personality variables. It's the most focal area for personality development. And problems in the frontal lobe can lead to personality changes, emotional and intellectual changes. The temporal lobe here on the side is um, got functions for language, receptive speech or language. That's Wernicke's area probably heard about that maybe with people who are alcoholic and that that or have dementia in that area being damaged and it's a prim primary auditory area it's responsible for memory and emotion and integration of vision with sensory information and problems in the temporal lobe can lead to visual or auditory hallucinations aphasia or amnesia and we'll look a little deeper at that eventually the occipital lobe back here um, functions includes, it's the primary visual cortex. Uh, it integrates vision with other sensory information and problems in the occipital lobe can lead to visual deficits, blindness, and or visual hallucinations. And then the parietal lobe, which sits right here, this green area, uh, the primary sensory area, and it's responsible for taste, reading and writing. And problems in the parietal lobe can lead to sensory perceptual disturbances and agnosia. And if you remember, agnosia is the inability to process sensory information. Uh, often there's a loss of the ability to recognize shapes or sounds or smells and um, can be damaged from strokes or dementia or other neurologic disorders. And the cerebrum also includes the cerebral cortex, the limbic system, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the basal ganglia. And the cerebral cortex controls a wide 
array of behaviors. Um, as, I, as I shared earlier, it can change kind of, it controls the contralateral or opposite side of the body so that the right hemisphere controls the left side of the body, the left hemisphere controls the right side of the body. Um, sensory information is relayed from the thalamus and then processed and integrated in the cortex. And it's responsible for much of the behavior that makes us human, such as speech, cognition, judgment, perception, and motor function. Next, we're going to take a look at the limbic system. And as I shared earlier, here we go. The limbic system has the hypothalamus. Um, and that plays a key role in various regulatory functions, such as appetite, sensation, or hunger, thirst, water balance, circadian rhythms, body temperature, libido, and hormonal regulation. The thalamus uh, is a sensory relay station, and except for smell, but it modulates the flow of sensory information to prevent overwhelming the core tasks, regulates emotion, memory, and related affective behaviors. The hippocampus, located here, regulates memory and converts short-term memory into long-term memory. And the amygdala is responsible for mediating mood, fear, emotion, and aggression. It's also responsible for connecting sensory smell information with emotions. The basal ganglia, also known as the corpus striatum, serves as a complex feedback system to modulate and stabilize somatic motor activity. It uh, plays a role in movement initiation, complex motor functions with association connections, and it functions in learning and autonomic actions such as walking or driving a car. Uh, it contains extrapyramidal motor systems of the, or nerve tract. Functions in involuntary motor activities, uh, such as muscle tone, posture, coordination. And many psychotropic medications can affect the extrapyramidal motor nerve tract, causing involuntary movement side effects, which we'll learn about. And problems in the basal ganglia can lead to bradykinesia, hyperkinesia, and dystonia. Okay, next we're going to take the brain stem. And the brain stem is uh, made up of cells that produce neurotransmitters. It includes the midbrain, the pons, the medulla, the cerebellum, and reticular formation. You can see the cerebellum here. I like this image because you can kind of see where the brain stem is located and the thalamus and the medulla. Sometimes it's hard to uh, picture that in your mind. So as we look at the midbrain, it houses the ventral tegmental area and the substantia nigra, and that's the area of dopamine hypothesis and dopamine synthesis. And we'll look at that in greater detail soon. Then we have the pons, which houses the locus ceruleus, and that's the area of norepinephrine synthesis. Then you have the medulla oblongata, or the medulla, and together with the pons, they contain autonomic control centers that regulate internal body functions. And then the cerebellum is responsible for maintaining equilibrium, acts as a gross movement control center, e.g. it controls uh, movement, balance, and posture. Each hemisphere of the cerebellum um, controls the same side of the body. So it's not like the cerebrum. Um, problems with the cerebellum can lead to ataxia, uncoordinated and inaccurate movements. And when you do the Romberg test, um, it's a, it can help detect for deficiencies in cerebellar functioning. The reticular formation system is what they call the primitive brain. It receives information from the cortex and innervates the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the cortex. You can see here where there's areas going out. Um, it has a regulation functions include involuntary movement, reflexes, muscle tone, vital, so vital sign control, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and it's critical to, critical to consciousness and ability to mentally focus 
be alert and pay attention to environmental stimuli. And I like this image here because I think it breaks everything down nicely for you, where you can see the cerebrum, the hypothalamus, the pituitary pons, the medulla, the cerebellum, brainstem, thalamus. A lot of things take place within here, which we'll start to learn about. And that concludes this presentation.